we take their seats, silence your cell phones. We will call the second meeting of the House Committee on Banking and Insurance to order at this time. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Representative All. Here. Representative Bentley. Representative Bray. Representative Duval. Here. Representative Fraser Gordon. Here. Representative Gooch. Here. Representative Justice. Here. Representative Lewis. Here. Representative McPherson. Here. Representative Rorix. Here. Representative Roberts. Here. Representative Smith. Here. Representative Stevenson. Here. Vice Chair Lockett. Here. Vice Chair Pollock. Here. Ch Chairman Meredith. Yes, ma'am. We do have a quorum and are duly constituted to do business. Uh, I do have a special guest that I want to recognize at this point in time. We have Miss Alba Sanderson out there with us observing the process today. She's a fifth grade student at Frankfurt Christian Academy and she's accompanying uh, her aunt, Miss Anne Marie Franklin. We are happy to have you here today, Alba. We only have one bill on the agenda today. It is House Bill 232. Representative Duvall, if you and the, those that are testifying with you would approach the table, introduce yourselves for the record, and then you all may proceed with your testimony. Representative Robert Duvall, District 17. Paula Smith, Vice President, Legal Services, Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance Company. Robert Payne, Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance Company, uh, Vice President of Claims. Anne Marie Franklin, Governmental Affairs Manager, Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance. All right, thank you all very much. Representative Duval, would you please go ahead and just give us the brief explanation of the committee substitute that we have? Yes, so basically what we're doing is changing the maximum percentage on non-catastrophic claims under 25,000 at 2.5% uh, to we're changing it to 10%. All right, do I hear a motion on sub? Motion on sub, Representative Bray, second, Representative Pollock. Uh, any questions on the committee substitute? Representative Gooch. So you're, you're saying 10% of the total claim? The, of the settlement. Of the settlement. Yes. So, okay. So. Other questions? All in favor of adopting the sub say aye. aye. Any opposed? We do have uh, enough votes to adopt the sub. Uh, Representative Duval, sub is before us. You may proceed with the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so nearly all public adjusters are uh, honest, hardworking individuals. Uh, but with all industries, uh, there are a few bad actors. So in order to protect consumers, we need to put up some guardrails. And House Bill 232 does just that. So let me go over a little bit about the bill. So it is a cleanup bill to mitigate uh, continuing issues within the insurance industry around storm chasing and uh, preying upon vulnerable consumers. In previous years, uh, Kentucky has taken steps toward mitigating these concerns uh, through previous legislation uh, targeting roofing contractors. While these steps were necessary, it is time that we take additional steps uh, following the natural disasters that we've seen in the past two years, the uh, uh, floods in eastern Kentucky and the tornadoes there in western Kentucky. So we're seeing an influx of uh, public adjusters coming into Kentucky from other states as regulations are being implemented elsewhere. While we currently license public adjusters and the Department of Insurance is doing their best to regulate and monitor activity around the state, we do not have uh, laws in place that create enforceable parameters uh, to protect Kentuckians uh, and create consistency. So basically this, this bill does three things, has three key issues uh, that are addressed in dealing with claims in Kentucky. So the three issues are transparency, conflict of interest, and consumer protection. So this bill and for, regarding the transparency uh, requires signed contracts uh, between public adjusters and insured to be shared with insurers and on file with the commissioner of the Department of Insurance. And uh, it also allows for those who are involved in the claim to communicate directly with the insured and direct access to the insured's uh, uh, property to continue with the processing of the claim. 
Second is the conflict of interest. So this bill prevents public adjusters from receiving direct or indirect compensation uh, on a claim outside of the signed contract. So this would apply to public adjusters who could be affiliated with contractors or others who are involved in the claim and receiving direct or indirect compensation from both aspects. And third is consumer protection. It, uh, this bill implements a threshold on the compensation a public adjuster may receive from the insurance settlement at 10%. This measure ensures that the consumer is not charged an unreasonable fee. And so currently there is no limit on the amount a public adjuster can receive from an insurance settlement. I have a motion by Representative Lewis on the bill as amended by the sub, second Representative Lockett. Uh, we do have a few that are opposed. Paula, Rob, do you all want to say anything now or would you all like to wait and, re and have a, a, a chance to come back after any questions come? Uh, we can, oh, sorry. Um, Mr. Chairman, we can go on and go if you want. We can be very brief. Just hang real tight and go ahead and uh, then hang tight for any questions that may okay. arise afterwards. Sure. Representative Smith, you got a question? I want to make sure I understand a public adjuster because I never have heard of one before. Uh, when I had a claim, the company would send an adjuster. Uh, so I have an option to request or how do I, how does the consumer know that they have an option for a public adjuster? That's a very good question, Representative Smith. There are three types of adjusters licensed in Kentucky. We have staff adjusters like what we have at Kentucky Farm Bureau. There are also independent adjusters that work for a specific company, um, say an agency, and they can work for different insurance companies that, that will go out and assist in claims. We have in fact hired independent adjusters in catastrophe situations that can assist us when we need the help. The third type of adjuster is the public adjuster. The, uh, I should designate to or clarify that the staff adjuster and an independent adjuster cannot charge a fee and not obtain a fee from the insured, but a public adjuster can. So that's the difference. The okay. public adjuster kind of works for themselves. Just a quick follow up, Mr. Chairman. So if I understand this correctly, you're wanting to put a 10% cap on the public adjuster. Correct, sir. To keep them from ambulance chasing type deal? Uh, they, he used a reference to chasing storms. So what you're saying is somebody knows how to handle the system or take advantage of the system. So you're saying it's being done by an outside third party. There, there, there's some way they reach out to them, come in with a different number. Your adjuster says 1,000, they come in with 2,000. Is that litigated at that point? Do they have a, since they're licensed, do they have authority? That's a lot, but let me try to, let me well, try to address your question. To, sure. I'm trying to put my sure. arms around. A lot of times happen. we have seen over the years, okay. public adjusters come into the state because other states are regulating them and regulating the amount that they can obtain on a contract okay. for the settlement. So, you know, we have our in-staff adjusters who will go and, and adjust the claim. But if they come to find out that a public adjuster is involved, as, assuming they have somehow come in contact with one of our customers or one of our members, then we are obligated to work with that public adjuster. You know, we want to try to do the best for our customers, so we're going to still settle and adjust the claim as we would. But what we have found over the years when more public adjusters come into the mix that there's a delay in the process. You know, under statute, we're obligated to settle a claim within a reasonable prompt amount of time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, when a public adjuster gets involved, there's a little bit of interference there with mm -hmm. working with our customer, which delays the claim, which tends to lead to a higher amount. Uh, a lot of times it's so the public adjuster potentially could get more um, from that settlement. And they were licensed with no cap? Start There's with. no cap right now at all in statute. Several states have, and for instance, um, Arkansas does not allow public adjusters at all. Um, Florida has just put in measures to cap it. Georgia legislature just put in a 30% cap, and so we're just asking for 10 here okay. in this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Representative McPherson. So public adjusters have to be licensed? Yes, that's, that's correct. correct. And they are licensed by the Department of Insurance. Okay, so they have reciprocity from state to state. They have no, unless unless a state prohibits them to come in, 
That's correct. Do they get a percentage of, like if the adjustment's high, do they get a percentage of the adjustment? I mean, I'm yes. a real estate appraiser. I am bound by law to set a fee. There's no such thing as it's against the law to get a percentage of the appraisal fee. So that incentivizes you to get a higher, and do a lot of times, I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions here, but is it, right. permit me, Mr. Chairman, to, so when, maybe when you all make an adjustment and if the property owner doesn't agree with it, will they go out then and get their own private adjuster? Is that what they? I'm gonna take that, Ralph. So that is an, an, a course that, that, that they could take. Um, you know, if they have made that choice to partner with a, a public adjuster, we want to work with them as well. Um, you know, sometimes Representative uh, Smith, McPherson, you know, there is some negotiation that has to take place. So I think where that question was coming up around, you know, if it was $2,000 from a public adjuster and $1,000 with our adjuster, sometimes it gets to be, we have to agree on the scope and when we don't agree on the scope, uh, that's where things, the conflict starts to arise and delays come into play. I hope yeah. that. Just one that final comment. Yeah. <clears throat> scope of work is the most important thing you start with, no matter what you do. Thank you. Paula, anything else right now that you all want to say? I just want to thank Representative Duval for sponsoring the bill. I also want to say we have uh, vetted this with the Department of Insurance. We've worked with them on the language. Um, and I know that the commissioner, she, she couldn't be here, but I've had conversations with her that, that's in support of this. And we've also vetted it with the insurance industry um, and I have full support. So I just appreciate uh, you all here in the bill today, um, Chairman Meredith, and, and thanks for um, um, hearing it today. Absolutely. We do have a few people who want to testify uh, with concerns about the bill. So if you all would just take a step back to the front row there. Uh, I have Tom Barrett, Richard Michelson, Karen Boone, and Ed Gould who have signed up to testify. Uh, if you all would come forward, uh, introduce yourself and who you represent for the record, uh, and then you all may proceed with any testimony you have. Hello. Thanks for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, give a more of a probably a balanced view of, uh, of, of what I think is going on. Let me get my notes. This is my first time here, so be a little patient. Um, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So a public adjuster is... Introduce yourself. My first, name is please. Tom Barrett. I'm a public adjuster. I've been a public adjuster for four years. Prior to that, I spent 28 years working for the insurance companies as an independent adjuster. Um, so what I do now is I'm an advocate for the consumer. I brought Karen Boone, who is one of my recent clients, um, but she'll give her testimony here shortly. But um, I guess the biggest concern is by capping our fees, um, we're not going to be able to handle the smaller claims. And we're just not. And, and Karen um, will tell you about her experience from her point of view. Um, let's see here. So basically a public adjuster, somebody, the way I handle it is I don't actually go out and market. I really don't market. I am, I'm a referral business. People approach me. Uh, after they've had an experience with an insurance company that they're uh, not happy with or they feel there's more there. I mean, typically, more money is paid out on a claim, not because a public adjuster is involved, but because there is coverage that was not initially addressed. Scope of repair is definitely very important, but that is the basis for how you begin these negotiations. You do have to determine scope. Uh, a lot of carriers have internal processes that they utilize that are not stipulated in the policy. That is also something else we deal with. Um, that's what everybody wanted me to say was basically discuss what a public adjuster is. Um, Representative Smith, do you have any questions? Well, you were asking what the public. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Again, I'm new to this. <laughs> you would ask the question. OK. I don't want to be scolded either. Um, that's really all I have to say. Um, I think 
the better testimony would be from somebody who's actually reached out to me after their initial experience with the insurance company and negotiating that labyrinth that it does exist in the claims department. I'm Karen I'm, Boone. Karen, I'm if you wait just a second, I do have a question from Representative Bentley up here. He, he asked to ask. Uh, I have, thank you, Mr. Chairman. When you said that you could only take down to a certain limit, I'm sorry, sir, I don't understand. You came and introduced yourself so you would only take down to a certain amount, low amount, before you would take that case. Uh, on, well, what I was saying is, I mean, and in getting into the economics of it, uh, you know, we it is a profession. We do this to help out as well as make an income. But at some point, it uh, maybe an example would be better. Let's say uh, Karen... Um, in, in her exact uh, case, she was paid below deductible amounts for your insurance claim, just a small residential roof claim. Um, after about three to five months, um, and I did charge her 15% for the additional, um, we, we got her $17,000 full roof replacement after going through uh, three adjusters that I personally went through. But there was a total of five. Total of five that they dealt with prior to reaching out to me and, and they were referred to me. Um, I had, if that, does that answer the question? So you have a minimum before you take a case? In that's other words. No. no, that's not what I'm saying. No. Um, what I'm saying is it's gotta be, uh, we've got to be able to cover our expenses, make an income as well as assist the consumer. Does that make sense? So there is no, limit on uh, what I'm willing to take. It's at my discretion yeah. currently. In, in my business, we always wanted to con cover our uh, cost and our inventory and all, but I would fill a prescription for a dollar and a half because I need to help the public. Agreed. So I, I don't understand why you got a minimum. Well, if I can't, I mean, not to get practical, but if I can't make a living doing it, I can't do the job. I mean, I think that's what it comes down to. So we, you know, I'm not saying that there isn't regulation that needs to be had. What I am saying is because of perceived, you know, activities of another party, I don't know that that the whole industry should be kind of, for lack of a better word, smeared and uh, affected by this. I mean, I, I do have a heart. I do want to help people out. But at the end of the day, I mean, I, I do have to uh, make a living. And I think that's, you know, I don't know if I'm helping myself here, but I'm being practical. Ms. Boone, if Thank you want to go ahead with your testimony, go ahead. Thank uh, you very much. Introduce yourself and then go ahead. My name is Karen Boone. I live in Fern Creek in Jefferson County. And there was a tornado that come through. It didn't hit us directly, but it, it tore my roof up. And the insurance company come out with an adjuster. And they said we had very minimal damage less than our deductible, which was $1,000. Well, after all the shingles that we picked up out of the yard and pictures and numerous conversations with the insurance company, they still denied our claim. The adjuster that they sent out was a contracted adjuster. Couldn't even tell the difference between a gable roof and a hip roof, which is we had a hip roof. And I knew right off the bat there's going to be trouble. But anyway, we fought for almost three months with the insurance company, kept denying our claim. And the whole, and the, we had to pay someone to come up to repair the roof so we wouldn't have damages on the inside. Repaired it, well, good enough to get it waterproofed. And still, the roof, he said we had damage up there. There's obvious wind damage. We had three roofers come out and said it was damaged, need to be fully replaced. And they still denied our claim. So, so one of the roofers told me about Tom. And I thought, well, you know, it's got to be cheaper than a lawyer. And he was. And after five months, maybe over five months, of fighting the insurance company, he, we had hundreds of pictures of the damage uh, I mean, it, it, it was a lot of correspondence, 
insurance adjusters, one after another, kept passing us off to another, to another, to another. And after months and months of all this, the last adjuster finally agreed the roof needed to be fully replaced. And they finally did replace it after Tom's help. And working with Tom, I have become very knowledgeable of insurance language and what they try to do to the consumer. I, we pay our premiums. In fact, we pay our premiums in full by the year because I want to make sure that everything's paid and we are covered. And then we had a claim, and they did not want to pay it. All they wanted to pay was less than our deductible to patch it up. When all the insurance, all the roofers said it needs to be fully replaced, and Tom jumped through hoop after hoop after hoop, and finally the last adjuster agreed that roof needs to be replaced. And they paid a $17,000 claim. That's all it was. Wasn't no million dollar claim. Nothing like that. $17,000 for a roof. And they kept denying it. And Tom got it paid. And his 15% that he charged on the $17,000, I was way more happy to pay that. Even though I had to pay $1,000 deductible, $2,400 for his, his fee, it was still cheaper than a $17,000 roof. And if it wasn't for Tom, I'd, had, I'd been out $17,000. And I'm just a little old, you know, girl from Fern Creek that don't know anything about insurance companies. But Tom went to bat for us, and he did an awesome job, and he never lost his cool because I probably would have talking to him. And all I can say is, 15% is nothing compared to the hours and hours and hours that he put in for over five months working for us, the little guy that has no voice in a billion-dollar company. And it was sad to think that these billion-dollar companies can just do that to somebody that is ignorant on their policies. It's sad, but companies do it to them all the time. And we need people like Tom, because he, if it wasn't for him, you know, I'd have me a monthly payment for a roof. $17,000 is a lot of money for me to pay for a roof. And it was noticeable damage, but for some reason they kept denying it. And I, I put him through all kinds of loops. Two bundles of shingles he had, we had to pay. Pay somebody to get up there to put them on they didn't match and Kentucky does have a match law that is not enforced because uh, it, it's enforced that it didn't the insurance company that we dealt with didn't have, know about it but they did uh, give us a big run around and it, it wasn't called for it was an obvious claim Tom come out and he talked to us about well you could try this with them and uh, see if that works. Well, it didn't. So we hired Tom, and he knows the lingo, the ins and outs of these insurance companies, and we weren't asking for anything that we didn't feel we had coming. And I have learned that an insurance policy is a legal binding contract, and they did not fulfill their end of the contract. And these guys that work all these hours, can you imagine working hours, you know, it's a 24-hour day job pretty much. We're answering phones and talking to insurance companies and hours and upon hours. And for a $17,000 claim and you only get paid $2,400 for it for five months' worth of work? I don't know anybody that worked for that. I mean, anybody have any questions, I'd love to answer them. I do have a question, I think, Representative Lockett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tom, thank you for being here. Um, I appreciate your testimony. I do have a question for you. Um, just in, in, in this claim instance, um, according to, to my math, you said you charged 15% of the $17,000 claim. That's, that's roughly $2,500 that, that you charge the client. Well, 2400 whatever the benefit of the deductible. Okay. So they have a deductible right. that's taken out. And then, so I, whatever checks they get after I'm hired, I get a percentage of it. 
Okay. So any monies before, if they were paid, I have no benefit of. Okay. Um, can you can you briefly detail um, how much time that you personally put into this claim? Was it a phone call? Was it a lot of phone calls? It was a lot of um, phone calls, a lot of emails. I mean, uh, how much time did you put into it? I mean, I don't keep track of the time. Um, I've got all the emails if you'd like to see them. I mean, it's. Um, I would say I've probably got, I mean, you were 45 minutes away from where right. I was. So I had to drive out there at least Numerous twice. times. Numerous. I would say, you know, I probably got 35 to 40 hours in it, you know, all things considered, picking up the shingles, that kind of thing, putting them out there. What uh, what would you say would be kind of the the, the scope of, of the work that you performed on, on this claim? The scope of the work uh, is adjustment. It's called, you know, it's a claims adjustment. We're adjusting the claim. That's what I do. Um, I go out, I document. I feel like I'm doing, me personally, I know the insurance companies don't feel that way when we're dealing with uh, a claim, but I feel it's a collaboration. Um, you know, they, the claims department of these insurance companies, they are, I mean, they are inundated. They are overworked. I mean, they have a lot going on. Me personally, I've got her claim. I work it. I document it with photos, whatever the insurance company wants. I think we even took videos twice mm -hmm. of your roof while the roof shingle was being installed, sent it to them. Um, I mean, it, it, it. I don't keep track of the time, but if I had to say, it was about 35 hours of doing whatever the insurance company wanted me to do over the course of three different adjusters prior, after the two adjusters she had already dealt with. One more question, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, can you can you kind of speak to I know you mentioned uh, you charge 15 percent of correct um, this this particular bill would cap that at 10 percent um, can can you speak to why you feel that that 10 percent is not enough I feel that uh, you know I think if you're getting a claim at the beginning and it's fresh and it's not uh, you know, it's not muddled you're not reviewing you're not analyzing the documentation that was generated in the prior um, insurance company adjusters uh, process I, I think maybe that's you know maybe reasonable maybe there's some stuff there but at the end of the day a lot of this is muddled I mean something that somebody's been dealing with for months or you know in some states years and then they get you involved I mean there, there, there is a lot of extra work to do I mean we have experts we have to coordinate it's emails multiple adjusters on one claim phone calls on Sunday night, Saturday night, keeping notes. Um, I mean, my, I keep a hard file. I think for your $17,000 roof, I want to say my file is about that thick. Um, you know, it, it's really hard to quantify, I guess, uh, and, and make an impression on you guys as to what we really do, but it's, it's kind of reactive. You know, it should go smooth. She should have had a roof, no doubt. In the state of Kentucky, she should have had a roof paid for. Shouldn't have had to do this. Shouldn't have had to hire me. Shouldn't have been out that money, which is my fee. Should have been paid originally the first day that that adjuster set foot. Did he even get on your roof? Um, if he got on her roof, then he should, you know, it's a no-brainer is what we say in the industry. It's a no-brainer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to make clear, and this claim is a, is a good example um, that has been brought forward. We adjusted in the committee substitute that you see before you now. Those claims were originally in the bill that was filed through the work of the insurance commissioner and the industry and um, Farm Bureau were originally set at 2.5% as the threshold. And by request... We moved that threshold up to meet the, the threshold of all the other larger claims at 10% in the committee substitute. So that's where all that language came from was, again, collaboration and negotiation. We've heard those words in this, in this presentation. So I just, I just want to make clear that we've had some collaboration and negotiation to get to where we are today. That's what the committee substitute is before you. Representative Lockett, or Representative Pollock. Just a quick question. Um, in this scenario here, you charged 15%. Is that a flat 15% that you charge for all your claims? Or if, say you got a $100,000 claim, does your percentage go up, down? How does that work? Um, I mean, it, I, I can't paint a, you know, a broad. I really have to take the claim at its own merit. Sure. See what I've got. I will say typically I charge 15%. Okay. 
Thank you. But that's not to say, you know, that would be on every claim. We got a couple other, a couple other people at the table. If you all would introduce yourselves for the record and go on with your testimony, and then we may have some more questions. Um, oh, you want to? Yeah. 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 Hi. Can everybody hear me? Oh, okay, you can hear me now. Richard Michelson, uh, born and raised in Louisville. I'm a licensed public adjuster, and um, I've been in the insurance industry about 33 years so I mean basically a year before I graduated college I got in the business and I've done various things in that business including uh, being an agent I'm a licensed consultant uh, I'm a certified risk manager certified insurance counselor and a licensed public adjuster I've been kind of a student of the insurance industry and business for for many years um, I think a couple of two of the main reasons we're here are Consumers need a choice. And uh, if the insurance company says A and the answer is really not A, they need a way to, to get to the right answer, to get to the right solution, if you will, for their claim. In terms of, as we talked about, scope and cost. Um, and we, we do a lot of that. We, we navigate the claims process for the claimant. Um, it's very complicated for those of you who have experienced a, an insurance claim on the property side, or, I mean, everybody's probably had an auto accident, I would guess, some kind of little fender bender, and it's a complicated process. Um, they need advocacy. So that's one of the big reasons we're here today is to, uh, we want to say, hey, we're willing and, and, and want to work with, uh, uh, the industry and the legislation here to or legislators to um, uh, uh, welcome things that are helpful to our industry and to consumers. So it's a big deal to satisfy the consumer. That's really why we're in business. Now, obviously, we have to make a living. And to my standpoint on this is from the get go, if we talk about percentages, yeah, it's a fresh claim. We can that 10 percent threshold is kind of an industry standard on a fresh new claim. The issue becomes, I think, on the mop-up money where somebody's maybe gotten $25,000 paid or offered, and then now we're going to go mop it up. Well, lots, as Tom used the term muddled, <laughs> I mean, lots of things have happened on the claim at this point, and we have to kind of mop it up. We have to forensically go back and look at what's happened and why it happened, and now we're going to mop up for what we call new money. You cannot uh, make you cannot uh, uh, make a living as a public adjuster with ten percent mop up money um, if that's the threshold. You just can't do it. You have to charge higher percentages to be able to take those claims. And if we're not able to take those claims and help the consumer, then that's going to cause a problem for the consumer. I mean, they're just the advocacy then that they get if they can't work through the standard claims process is they're probably going to have to go lawyer up. Um, note also what's interesting is a lot of times lawyers hire us to help them with claims. We understand the language. We understand the mechanics of it all. We, uh, we really we understand policies, how they work, what's replacement costs, what's actual cash value. So we're, we're here really for a couple reasons. We're here, consumer needs an advocate, and that's what we do. And then we obviously want to do this and make a living. And it's 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 next to impossible at the fee cap on the mop up money would be where I think the problem really is. If we're talking about fee caps, um, we just have to be able to charge a higher number. So the consumer then has a choice to come to us to help them with their claim. Again, those of you that have had a claim, very confusing process. And especially if you get involved in a cat situation, a catastrophe, lots of different adjusters from out of town. You know, even if you're dealing with a local insurance company, chances are they're staffing up by hiring independent adjusters. And you just have to have an advocate to help you out with that. And we want to help the consumer. We want to make, be able to make a living. And the fee cap on the mop-up money, I think, is really where the big rub is. Um, I brought with me Ed Gould. And um, Ed is now retired. He owns real estate, but he had a, a medical equipment business in Louisville, Kentucky, and, and suffered a substantial loss. It was a roof collapse situation. And basically, if you can just kind of comment on, I think it'll help them understand what a public adjuster really does and how we helped you, that would be great. 
Okay, I'm Ed Gould. Um, I owned uh, Gould's Discount Medical um, in Louisville um, and uh, owned the property um, also. Um, back in, in 2017, I believe, uh, uh, we had an unusual rainstorm in which the, uh, uh, the, um, the water puddled uh, on top of the roof. Uh, and collapsed the roof and it happened about 2.30 in the morning and thank God nobody was hurt uh, but it did damage the building uh, substantially with uh, four, four suites were uh, deemed unoccupied uh, uh, un, uh, for a period of time. Uh, that period of time was six months Actually, it was uh, probably over a year, a year, a year and maybe three months. But for six months, the uh, claim adjuster who worked for the company, um, was an employee of the company, uh, denied the claim. Now, <laughs> I've, I've been paying insurance for 30 years on that building and, and uh, had all, you know full coverage. And how in the world is it possible that it, they could deny a claim where um, the roof collapsed. Well, they did. And uh, their take on it was that it was the responsibility of the tenant who was paying me rent uh, to make the claim. Well, um, I don't know too much about insurance, but uh, it, I think a fifth grader would know that it was my building and it was uh, th that uh, I was paying the premium, and he was he was a guest of mine. He was a tenant of mine, and that uh, th he shouldn't have had any liability. Well, after five months of fighting with them, and having not gotten rent from any of the other tenants, uh, I called uh, Richard, and uh, he took over the claim, and. Uh, uh, Somehow or another, he got he, he uh, made them pay the claim, and uh, I, I don't know exactly what you did, but uh, he did it. And uh, we've had after after they started paying the claim, uh, it was a period of about a year before uh, the claim was finished, and uh, we had. Uh, four or five different meetings with them. Uh, Richard uh, had uh, somebody come down, one of his employees come down and make sure that all my expenses were in there. And uh, that's how the claim was uh, settled. So it, I think it was like a $1.3 million claim. And uh, I don't know what I would have done. I guess I would have had to hire a lawyer because I knew I was in the right. Uh, lawyers had told me that I was in the right, but uh, uh, I depended on him to do it, and he did a good job. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from members of the committee? Representative Gooch. Thank you, Mr. Gould. I, uh, you know, I've been in the insurance business and real estate for for quite some time, and I understand that uh, roofs are designed for water flows off of them um it, it would appear to me that if you had a situation where water puddled to the extent that it would force the roof to collapse that you might have had a maintenance issue that wasn't taken care of yeah i i had now it's an interesting uh um, comment i uh before that i had somebody uh i hired a man to come every three months to check my roof to make sure all the gutters were cleaned out, make sure all the downspouts were fine. And, you know, so I did take the initiative. Uh, their, their response to me was that was not the issue. The issue was a legal issue. They, they, they had no problem with the maintenance. Their issue was a legal issue that the Lab Corps, which is a national outfit uh, who rented the uh, 
uh, the suite adjacent to where it collapsed, they were responsible. And uh, I, I, I don't see how they could have been responsible. And the lawyer told me that they weren't responsible because I, I showed him, you know, the claim. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't think about hiring a lawyer, but I did get a lawyer's opinion on it. And I, I guess I would have had a hire a lawyer if Richard wasn't available. Thank you. Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I've got a couple of questions around the percentages and the, clap, the caps and the rates, and I don't know if it should go to this group or the folks who testified earlier or even our commissioner who I see walked in after we got the thing going. Are you all advocating for no cap? I think a re whoop. No, a reasonable cap. And then what, if you, What's the number? Well, I think each claim speaks for itself in terms of like how you're going to handle it and what percentage you would need to charge. So we're um, supposed to trust you like well, let me, uh, if I can, let me make a couple comments. I'd heard in other states, I can't remember which one it was, we were talking about it. I think there's Georgia had 30. I think there was a 30. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I have a different model. I think each adjuster has a different model. But what I can tell you is that a reasonable fee cap, uh, I think would give the levity for if someone complained that, hey, I had so-and-so work for me as a public adjuster and their fee cap wasn't reasonable, if the word reasonable was in there, that might give the insurance department some levity. Now, I can tell you that uh, that thirty percent seems like that might be in the ballpark. Um, uh, my my structure is different on mop up money. My ten percent at the onset is that that's fine. It's that mop up that's an issue. And to speak to that again, the other state having thirty, uh, that's a little higher than what I do, but that's kind of, it's in the ballpark. It's what, in the ballpark. And and that would be on mop-up money, mop-up money. Yeah, I don't know what mop-up is either. That's a good oh, that would, I'm sorry. <laughs> that would be – so let's just say you had a claim. Uh, you hired us at the beginning, and we, we dealt with it. It was a 10% deal. So we charged 10% of the, of the settlement, okay? But then you come to us and say, hey, Rich, you know, um, I, I already got some money or an offer from the insurance company. Um, it was $50,000, um, can you help me? Well, we can't do a 10% model on the mop-up money, the additional money over and above what they have been offered or paid. So we want those that ability on the mop-up to be higher. So that that because... What, the, what number? Um, it, I mean, if I were to throw out a number, that Georgia number is okay. I personally, I'm a 25% guy on the mop-up. Motion on the bill. Motion on the bill. Commissioner Clark... And I hate to put you on the spot coming in late. Uh, I know you had to testify in another meeting. Uh, but could you come up and explain a little bit about what we talked about the other day with regard to that 10% cap and how it operates? Come on to the, to, to, to the table. If you, one of you all could make room for, for Commissioner Clark. and. Let me identify myself, Sharon Clark, Commissioner of the Department of Insurance. And I would like to tell both of these folks, the Department of Insurance would have been very willing to help them. We do that every day. So anyway, uh, we, um, Chairman Meredith asked me the question about the 10%. So when a claim is uh, for an insurance company. Let's say that I have a insurance claim at my home and the estimated value of that claim is $25,000. What the 10% represents is that the policyholder will get a check for $25,000. However, due to the contractual arrangement, they will pay 2,500 to the public adjuster their work and that is extrapolated out through you know whatever the claim is now there have been a lot of figures thrown around there are two states that I know that have a limit of 20% Georgia is the only state that has 30 
but the vast majority of the other states in of which I'm a member have a range of five to fifteen percent. So I, you know, when this the ten percent we thought was a reasonable reimbursement rate for this. Does that answer your question, Mr. Chairman? Thank you. All right. I have a motion on the bill. Do I have any other questions from members of the committee at this point? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, call the roll. Representative All? Aye. Representative Bentley? Aye. Representative Bray? Representative Duvall? Aye. Representative Fraser Gordon? Yes. Representative Gooch? Yes. Representative Justice? Yes. Person? Yes. Representative Pollock? Yes. Representative Oryx? Yes. Representative Roberts? Yes. Representative Smith? Yes. Yes. Chairman Meredith? Yes. Um, House Bill 232, as amended by the committee substitute, does pass with favorable expression. Same shit on the House floor. I do appreciate all sides being here, those op opposed to the bill and those in favor of the bill to, to provide your testimony. Uh, and that is the only bill that we have on the agenda today. So do I hear a motion to adjourn? Hear a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, say aye. 